This is on a topic that's very different from yesterday's class. This is on perception as the base and standard of knowledge. And we're going to focus on the epistemological function of perception, its role in knowledge. In the book, I have some discussion of the metaphysics of perception and the science of perception. I'm not going to be covering that in this uh, talk. I'm going to be focusing on the epistemological role of perception, namely as the base and foundation, because that is, I don't know, I'm tempted to say the most important fact in setting one's epistemology. It's rivaling the theory of concepts. You really need those two things. Perception is the base. Here's how concepts are formed. And we're going to discuss that in the last two lectures of this course, that being how concepts are formed. Incidentally, part of the difference of what you're hearing in this class from what's in my book is due to the very insightful comments of Greg Salmieri and Ankar Gadi, who spent uh, 10 hours with me on the phone discussing the material in uh, the first three chapters of my book. And the presentation you're getting, I think, is much better organized in response to um, their input into this uh, preparation. So I want to acknowledge them and express my gratitude to them. So from last class, we had Ayn Rand's definition of epistemology, a science devoted to the discovery of the proper methods of acquiring and validating knowledge. Now, the facts that give rise to the need for such a thing as epistemology determine its scope. The goal of epistemology is to gain knowledge, which we saw last time is to grasp facts, mentally grasp facts. The means of epistemology will be a certain processes that you will perform such as definition, reduction, proof, concretization, essentialization. There'll be certain processes, integration, that will be recommended. We don't know what they are yet at this stage of our development, but that's all we've got to work with. That's what epistemology is going to tell us. Do this and that in order to obtain knowledge. That's what we're looking for. So what kind of process, in principle, could epistemology recommend? And what would it apply that process to? Well, epistemology is going to tell us, do this, don't do that. Right? So it has to be some process that's, that epistemology is dealing with the kind of process that we can control. It can't say obey the law of gravity or disobey the law of gravity is one of the processes that you should perform because it's not up to your choice. And the materials on which that process operates have certain requirements if it's going to be a knowledge obtaining uh, process. The ultimate material must be independent of our choice. Now, this is the flip side of what I just said. The processes that you use to work up the material to get knowledge have to be under your control, a matter of your choice. But the material ultimately has to be something beyond your choice because you're trying to know reality. You're not trying to know a made-up world that you created. You're trying to know what nature gives you. So the material on which you must ultimately work has to be independent of your choice and not itself the product of some earlier process. Whatever is the, the raw material, the ultimate primary original raw material that knowledge works with, 
comes from reality. It comes from outside you. And that is the given. Whatever this is, whatever this primary material is that you don't control, that just comes to you, is provided to you, work with this. This comes from the world. This you didn't make up. That's called the, the given. Nature gives it to you as the raw material for you to work up into concepts, conclusions, value judgments. And as I said, it's cognitively primary material, the given. It cannot be, as we'll see in a second, something that comes from something else that in consciousness. It has to be the original. Now let's survey mental processes to see what meets these criteria to find out what is that which we control and what is the given. That's what we're, our goal is. That's what epistemology has to begin with. What's the given and what's our working up of material that starts as the given? There are two kinds of mental processes, cognitive, those that aim at knowledge, and non-cognitive. So let's get the non-cognitive out of the way. It was a big advance for human beings when they discovered that these were non-cognitive, but for the last 3,000 years, it's been pretty well known, except maybe not for the last one. <laughs> Dreams. Originally, people think that dreams and hallucinations are contact with another part of reality. They don't understand that dreams are non-cognitive, that they're just things thrown up by the brain. Imagination is a little more easy to see that that's not cognitive because you make it up. That's what making up means. That's what imagination means. So you picture something, you do with it what you will. It doesn't represent the state of reality, it represents what you want to do with material that came from reality. And emotions are not cognitive, they are reactions to earlier conclusions. You've decided that, oh, liver is a bad thing, as I have, that is liver to eat. Yuck. So when you see it on, when I see it on the menu, you may love it. When I see liver, you know, I have an emotional reaction. Oh boy. That's a reaction to the conclusion I form from experiences with the liver. It's not a fresh cognition of reality. It's a reaction to a cognition in the past. So we can get rid of those I don't mean get rid of them, like not have them, but they are not in the running for what epistemology uses and what is the base of what it uses. So among the cognitive mental processes, there are beliefs and values. What's well, a product of a process? These are not processes now, these are products of processes, but coming to believe and coming to value, valuing is the process. Remembering, which I've written here as memories, and perceiving, which I've written as perception. Now there are one, maybe two other things you could put in here, but these are the main cognitive processes. So are any of them, what is their status? This is what, how epistemology gets going. Which of these are rock bottom reality provided things that form the base and standard and which are built up from that. Well, obviously beliefs and values are reached volitionally. They're, they're not nature given. They're derivative from your experiences and from your earlier conclusions. So if you think there is a God, that's not something that you got from reality feeding it into you. It's something you were told something you absorbed, something that you can get rid of and should. So obviously beliefs and values, uh, liver tastes good or liver tastes bad, but more importantly, freedom is good, freedom is bad. Those are not primaries, they're derivative. 
They involve a great deal of volition, which is why people differ in their beliefs and values. They arrive at it in different ways. Memories, now memories are an interesting case because memory by and large is uh, deterministic, but there's certainly a great scope for volition in memory. I don't know if you have experienced cases in which you remember something very clearly and then you find definitive proof that it didn't happen. I had one such incident. My memory is generally very good, but there's one case in which I was told about something so vividly that I remembered it as if I had seen it. But I, I later found a letter that I had written that said I, I wasn't there, I heard about it. People's values and desires can influence how they remember things. Now that, of course, is high-level memory. If we're just talking about what happens at age one, what gets remembered and what doesn't, I, don't, I doubt there's much scope for volition to influence it. But memory is somewhat influenceable by volition. It's not totally neat. It's not like a photograph. It's not metaphysically given, it's more or less metaphysically given with editorializing possible from free will, from your values. But even if it were 100% deterministic, it's derivative. A memory is a copy, insofar as it is accurate, it is a copy of something else. So this memory cannot be the primary source. There's something to compare memory against, and that's perception. But once we get to perception, we've got what we're looking for. It's deterministic, it's automatic, it's physiologically set. There's no scope for volition. It's primary. It's not a copy of something else. It's not a combination made up of other things. It's the original raw material of knowledge. Now, some of you may want to object. Uh, volition can influence perception because you choose what to look at. But that's a, not the relevant sense of affecting perception. Once you choose to point your eyes in a certain direction, what comes in is absolutely beyond your control. It's determined. Whereas with imagination, you can just do what you want with it. To be sure we're all on the same page. Perception, we're talking about seeing, hearing, touching, smelling, tasting. We're not using the wider sense of perception, which just means awareness. It's automatic. It's not volitional. It's a response to physical contact with reality, and it's a primary. All those things together make it the given that we were looking for, the rock-solid base of everything else. Everything else that you control or copy or work up has to adjust to the perceptually given, which is self-evident and is the base of everything else. So let's now turn knowing that perception is the gold standard. Seeing is believing, as they say. Knowing that, let's look to what perception gives you. What is the content of perception? And this is not, strangely, is not generally appreciated or understood. The first point Ayn Rand insists upon and is the foundation of all the rest, Perception gives you entities, meaning what? Meaning if you perceive an apple, you perceive an apple, you don't perceive redness plus roundness plus sweetness plus slick surfaceness. You perceive an apple and those attributes are abstracted out from the apple. This will become very important when I give my attack on sensationalism in a few minutes. So the first thing you must know that Ayn Rand stresses is that perception gives you entities and it gives you attributes, it gives you actions, it gives you relationships, but as among entities. 
It does not give you free-floating aspects of entities. Now, I go on to add, it gives you a world of entities. Look around you. Philosophers are apt to imagine or take as their prime case of perception this. You see an apple as if the apple were floating in a void, in a black, featureless space. You see an apple. No, you always see, for those who may be not getting the video, I'm holding up an apple. The apple is in my hand, attached to my wrist, attached to my arm that you're seeing against the black background, uh, coincidentally with the earlier slide, of the curtains in a room at a certain height in a world, moving up and down as I... That's what it is to see an apple. It's to see a scene, S-C-E-N-E, of which the apple is a part. So as I put it, Perception is of a world of entities spatially arrayed. Entities are distinguished by their position. That's how we perceive it. As opposed to what? Well, you're eating ice cream and you say, you know, I taste some cinnamon in here. That cinnamon as against the creaminess and the sugariness is not spatially isolated for you. You can isolate that taste sensation, but you don't have an array of spaces of flavors that you can move upon and pick up one. Perception is of a world of entities spatially arrayed, and it's a world that you're in. Perception has a here here where I am and there, which is far from me. It's near to me and far from me. And you actually, of course, see parts of your bodies and you see the edge of your nose. You are in that world. Perception gives you a sense of self in the world. And it's not a static world. It's a world in which you act and are acted upon You act, you move, and your perception changes as you move, right? Move your head around, and you see things change, right? Not only is it a world in which you move and act, if you don't move yourself through that world, you will not get the perceptual level. My old professor Richard Held and his uh, associate Alan Hine did the classic experiment where they raised kittens in two conditions, active and passive. I'm going to zoom in. This is a cylinder with two kittens in it. I'm going to try and give you detail. You see the poor little thing on the left is riding in a gondola going around this uh, circular path. This is the only visual experience the kittens get up for the first several months of their lives. It's got those stripes just to give them something uniform to look at, something that has got a little bit of detail, but which is controlled. Across from him, there's the active kitten. You see the one on the right, you see from behind. It's tied to this apparatus, but it walks. The other one is carried. As the active one walks, it propels, it turns that shaft that goes across the top, and the passive one is drawn through the same environment. So the whole thing is to create two conditions. You ride or you walk. You see the same thing, exactly the same thing. There's only those walls to see, and otherwise they're raised in total darkness other than the hour they have in the carousel. So the two kittens see, in the sense of what comes in, exactly the same thing on average. Only the active kitten develops a perceptual level. If you take the passive kitten, and I've seen the films of this, 
You take the passive kittens after a month or so growing up in this kitten, and you bring it to the edge, it just sits there. If you take the active kitten who moved himself and bring him to the edge, it puts its paws out. You put the uh, kitten on the visual cliff, what they call the visual cliff, which is just a cliff except there's glass so the ca uh, kitten won't actually fall. So when they call it a visual cliff, what you have is a tabletop this high and then pattern textured floor that the kitten can see way down here, only there's plexiglass over it so if the kitten walks off the cliff, it won't be hurt. That's the only reason it's called visual. It can see the drop off and it doesn't see the plexiglass. Normal kitten will avoid, it wants to walk from here to here, it will avoid the visual clip. Passively raised kitten riding through the same visual scene will walk off the cliff half the time. We'll walk this way, we'll walk this way. And it, it does not know that it's bad to fall off the cliff. So, the interesting lesson is that there's not a mind-body dichotomy even on the perceptual level. There's what Held calls sensory motor integration. Motor meaning what you do with your muscles, what you do in action in the world. This experiment shows that if you don't have feedback about what your own movements do to perception that comes in, you won't develop perception. You'll still see, oh by the way, once the kittens who had been raised passively were given some time out of the gondola in the light, they learned, I don't remember how long it took, but it wasn't incredibly wrong, they learned to perceive naturally. So you need the feedback of the effects of your own movement in order to develop the perceptual level. Perceptual level is more than just mouth open, spectating, you know, passively an incoming scene. Now here's my definition of perception trying to capture all the foregoing. Perception is an ongoing awareness of discriminated entities, meaning entities set off against each other, in their relative positions. I dropped out the word spatially because space is not a thing, it's only a relationship among entities and I didn't want to summon up that bad metaphysical context. Ongoing awareness of discriminated entities in their relative positions gained from actively acquired sensory inputs from reality. Actively acquired, not just passively riding through. Ongoing awareness, not a snapshot. Entities is the primary, the essential. But the other material is important to understand about perception. And let me make the contrast now, the big enemy, sensationalism. There are many meanings of sensation. I read an article by a researcher who distinguished six in the field of experimental psychology, six different meanings of perception. There are only three that are important for us as philosophers. The first one is okay. Sensation is what a worm has. Sensation is what a lower organism has that can only respond through local sense receptors on its body, so maybe it can feel pain and pleasure if it's hurt or not hurt. Maybe it can feel hot or cold, but it can't perceive entities in the world. If you say that the worm has only sensation, that's fine. There's no philosophical problem. It's also okay to use very different meaning now to talk about the sensation of brightness or the sensation of tasting cinnamon, the sensation of uh, a particular shade of yellow that's as narrow as a human eye can detect. And that meaning, a sensation, is the smallest measurable dimension of a whole perceptual context. That's okay. You can say, 
I have a, a brightness is a sensation that's part of the whole perceiving of a scene that I'm in and I move around it. Yeah, you can analyze it down that way. Here's what's wrong. Here's what I'm calling sensationalism. Atoms of experience, sensations are atoms of experience as the mind assembles into percepts. So you put it, the theory is you put together brightness and hardness and redness and smoothness to perceive the apple. You do not put together different sensory qualities to perceive the thing. You perceive the thing and you can abstract out various dimensions, various small attributes, characteristics of the thing that are in that totality. But perception is not derivative from sensation. That's the error. Sensations are not the given. The perceptual level is the given. Sensations, in fact, are an abstraction from perception. The fallacy involved is reification, making a thing out of what is an abstraction. In the book, I give the example, which I think is a killer example, of a wind blowing from the northeast. So what's the northeast here? Is Vancouver? That would be northwest. We can take that. Is Vancouver northwest of here? Okay, well, approximately. Let's say it is. Let's stipulate. So there's a wind coming from Vancouver. Now you can look at that and break it into two components. You can say, well, it has a force in the east-west direction of three miles an hour, and it has, I guess that's a velocity. In the north-south, it has a component that's eight miles an hour, and the resultant is the, let's say, nine mile an hour Vancouver coming wind, from Vancouver coming wind. But the, there is no east-west component in reality. There is no north-south component in reality. There's only the wind coming from Vancouver. Your apparatus of analyzing that is to break it down using Cartesian coordinates and say there's an X component and a Y component. That's a way, that's perfectly valid, way of measuring. But it's, it would be a mistake to say, gee, I guess there were two winds, one east-west and one north-south, and they got put together, and that's the wind that we experienced. You can see that would be completely backwards, that you analyzed it out. It had, doesn't have to be combined back together because you analyzed it out. Same is true of brightness. You didn't have to put together brightness and uh, redness to get the apple. I hope it looks sort of bright red. Shininess and, and redness, anyway. You didn't have to put them together to see the apple. You see the apple, and when you get to be of a certain age that you can conceptualize attributes, you learn shiny, and you learn red, and you can break it down. You can break it down, what is not broken down in your experience. Perceptual awareness is not what sensationalism takes it to be. Perceptual awareness is global, unified, not a mosaic of sensations. We directly perceive entities in the world. It's called direct realism. We do not assemble percepts. We directly see a world of entities. The integration, such as it is, the way, if you want to look at it as an integration, the integration involved in perception is done automatically by the brain, not consciously by the mind. You don't have to figure out, hmm, why can trains go down the railroad track since they seem to come together? How does a train go to the... When the railroad tracks come to a point, how does... Oh, I guess that the tracks don't really come together. They just seem to come together. Sorry, they don't seem to come together. That is a 
advanced perspectival view on your experience. Parallel lines do not seem to you to converge. If they did, you would see these as converging. You don't. You would see everything in this room, unless you're an artist and learned how to do all these lines as coming to a point. You don't. It takes a very sophisticated perspective to do that. There's many other ways that artists can see the elements that combine automatically to give you a perceptual scene, in, and we can't. For, uh, that is, we non-artists. For instance, you see someone with a white shirt like Ed's. If you were an artist, you would see, and trained to do this, you could see all kinds of colors in that, and if you painted his white shirt, you might never paint any white. It's amazing. But there's all kinds of reflected colors that go in, but we don't perceive them. We perceive the sum total, which comes out as white. So the wrong views that abound about perception is voiced most strongly by Kant and a contemporary called Quine. Kant's view is that we use concepts to construct percepts out of sensations. We use concepts, like for instance, well, I, I know that people don't get smaller actually as they go away, so I guess even though they seem to get smaller, they don't really get smaller, so I correct, I correct my vision with my concepts, and I perceive them as they are because I used my knowledge to change the way I perceive No. You do not perceive people as getting smaller when they're farther away. That again is like the converging railroad tracks, railroad tracks a sophisticated perspective on what you, uh, how you would draw what you see. You do not see people, even though they occupy a smaller portion of your visual field, you do not see this as being smaller, because it's too far away to have much of a difference. The guy in front of you does not look smaller to you than the guy three rows closer to me. He looks closer to you. Closer does not look smaller. So Kant thinks it does and thinks we need to engage in a mental correction of our sensations to form our perceptions. And he seems almost tame compared to Willard Van Orman Quine, not a name from Atlas Shrugged, a real named Willard Van Orman Quine, Harvard philosopher, uh, one of the most influential of the 20th century, he's in the top three, it was at Harvard. He says, physical objects, meaning entities, right, are conceptually imported into the situation of perceiving as convenient intermediaries, simply as irreducible posits comparable epistemologically to the gods of Homer. So not only do we not perceive entities, we conceptually import them as hypotheses, but they're lousy hypotheses, they're as bad as religion. So your belief that I'm a thing up here talking to you is no better than the jihadist belief that he's going to get 64 virgins after he dies. They're equal, according to the leading, one of the top three philosophers of the 20th century. The right view for a breath of fresh air from introduction to objectivist epistemology, percepts, not sensations, are the given, the self-evident. The knowledge of sensations is not direct. It is acquired by man much later. It is a scientific conceptual discovery. There's another hero here besides Ayn Rand on this topic, James J. Gibson. I discuss in my book several of his good, uh, terrific ideas. I won't have time to do that in these lectures because I'm cutting out the science to save time, but I recommend and when I say I recommend, I think this is something that everyone will enjoy reading, who's at all interested in how the mind works. It's really unusually, strikingly, startlingly good and informative. 
It's called the ecological approach to visual perception. And don't be scared by ecology there. It does not have anything to do with the environmental movement. It just means in the biological context, a biocentric view of uh, approach to visual perception. Unfortunately, I will only be able to whet your appetite here by giving you some of his good philosophical statements rather than going into his actual discoveries in psychology, but you see how unusual this is. Perceiving is an achievement, not an appearance in the theater of consciousness. It is a keeping in touch with the world, an experiencing of things, entities, rather than a having of experiences. Boy, is that ever needed in philosophy. There is no content of awareness independent of that of which one is aware. Yesterday, right? A consciousness, consciousness of nothing is a contradiction in terms. A contra consciousness, conscious of nothing, but itself is a contradiction in terms. It had to be aware of something. Okay, let's round this out now. We know the perception is, in fact, the given. We know it's not sensation. It's not memory. It's not beliefs and values. It's not dreams, imagination. It's perception is the rock bottom, solid, foundation, self-evident base to which everything must adjust. But what if you don't get that? The three approaches to epistemology, again, mysticism, skepticism, and objectivism. Mysticism says you can know without perception or reason. Right? God just tells you. Skepticism, you can't know anything. Objectivism can know by perception or reason based on it, but it's the primacy of perception, as I call it. The primacy of perception. Within cognition, perception is primary. Mysticism. The revealed truth is self-evident. This is on the issue of what's self-evident. Skepticism. Nothing is self-evident. Objectivism. Only perceptual material is self-evident. There's an exact statement of Ayn Rand, virtually word for word for that. I think it's the only thing that's self-evident is the material provided in sense perception. So self-evident doesn't mean obvious. It means the incontestably given that you're directly aware of that's reality. 2 plus 2 is 4 is obvious, but it's not self-evident. Individual rights, contrary to the declarations, very beautiful language, is not self-evident. Individual rights are not self-evident. What is their view of perception? Mysticism. Perception is only a distraction from the revealed truth. Plato is very big on this. He says, close your eyes. Stop perceiving. That ties you to this world. You must shut off your senses in order to know. Skepticism says perception, like concepts, is only a subjective interpretation. So it's useless. <clears throat> Objectivism says perception is the base of everything else, the court of final appeal. So then we get to the cashing in. Because of their views on perception and foundations, mysticism says, don't think belief. Skepticism says, why bother thinking? It's just, you're just going to come up with some subjective idea. And so why go to the trouble? Objectivism says, think or die. Think or die. A little negative, but... It's the wake-up call to people. Think and live is not quite as strong as think or die. Ray. Hi. Um, I just have a question. Um, uh, could there be a cognitive aspect to dreams? And what I'm thinking about is when you have the phenomenon where you're thinking really hard on a problem and you wake up in the morning and you kind of say, aha, I know the answer. Is that cognitive or? No, nothing cognitive goes on in dreams. However, uh, there are two things. 
dreams, and I'm going by my introspection, your mileage may vary. Dreams uh, in the morning fade into wakeful thought. And I go, not, not only linearly, first of all, not only is it a slow emergence into consciousness, it's hard to say where I stopped dreaming and I started perceiving or thinking, but it's not, it's like the stock market, you know, it's, it moves, but in ups and downs, so I can be, I've had dreams where I'm arguing with someone, and he says, how do you know you're not dreaming? <laughs> and I give him a knockdown answer, that just, you know, like, well, it's an accident. I don't know, it has no content, but it has the emotional feeling of I gave a great refutation, and then, of course, I wake up. You think that's bad, you're not a philosopher. Here's what's bad, then I wake up. Okay, so I dream that I'm waking up, and I say, oh my God, I gave that argument and I was asleep, that's a problem. Then I actually wake up, that is bad. Now I think what actually goes on there is I did wake up, and then I quickly fell back asleep and I woke up again. I think that's what happened. I don't, I don't know how you would dream that you're waking up. I don't think that has a lot of content. But I go through this borderline area where I am capable of thought and I'm not really dreaming. I'm just continuing the dream a little bit volitionally, um, half aware that it's a dream. I definitely go through that say. The other thing is, even leaving out the borderline cases, if you're working on a problem, you're gonna, after you dream, when you've actually woken up, you're gonna be thinking about it. And I do this, and I'm, I know, I'm very aware that I'm awake with my eyes open, but something has gone through my mind from the dream, and I'm using it to try and solve a problem. That happens. Uh, it is, possible, but extremely unlikely that a dream image could hold the key to, your, to the solution of your problem. There are reported cases like the benzene ring with Kukula where he dreamt of a snake swallowing its own tail. Um, my view is that the subconscious in dreams is merely sending up whatever images are being thrown up as house cleaning is done. So it's like the maid is down there vacuuming the dust and moving stuff around, and you see the stuff move around. There's nothing, there's no problem solving going on during dreams or ever in the subconscious. All problem solving is conscious. The subconscious, this is my own view, and it's not Ayn Rand's. And she tended to view the subconscious as active when, when you're not. I don't. I don't uh, think that's true at all. I think the subconscious is a library, a set of files, a database. It does nothing on its own. You pull up stuff from the subconscious. That's a big topic that we can discuss at some other time. So Thank that's you. the answer. My answer, actually. Al? Yes, uh, my question has to... Oh, oh, I'm supposed sorry. to alternate. I'm oh. sorry, I didn't need to. Go ahead. Yes, it's uh, Mr. Moran again. <laughs> um, so uh, I wanted to get back to uh, your discussion about um, the uh, the supposedly conceptual-related nature of perception according to W. V. O. Quine and others. Um, and uh, I, I was just hoping you could elaborate on that a little more in depth because um, it's, uh, sure. you know, I mean, it's clear from things like primitive art that when people try to reproduce their own experience, that they do have to learn to see things like the converging lines um, or uh, distance uh, or size changes in distance. You know, like in medieval art, it's uh, very well known that people were sized according to their status in society, not their distance from the viewer. Um, or, or their importance in the story of the painting, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it seems... Uh, clear that, you know, on the visual field, it seems so obvious, you know, that your head is tiny and the microphone is huge. 
So uh, how, how can, can you like relate there those things and elaborate on the, that? The idea of a visual field, yeah. She asked many questions. Let me try and... <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, uh, could I elaborate on the wrong view, I'm condensing it, of uh, what goes on in perception vis-a-vis -vis sensation because in a certain sense it seems like we do experience in the visual field things farther away or smaller. So could I elaborate on that? Yes, I can. It's not going to convince the uh, dedicated opposition in the audience. I know, you know I've had long arguments with people. I can convince you, but it'd take a long, long time and we don't have that. My answer is that the visual field is an abstraction. We don't see any visual fields. We see people. Did I pull out the plug? I guess it doesn't matter. Slides are over. We see things out there. We don't have a visual field. Visual field is a construct. Gibson is very good about that. He used to use a term like that, the perceptual world and the real world. He came to realize as he went further along the path his own good premises took him that there is no such thing as the visual field. There's the angle subtended by the light rays coming in. And you can say a distant object subtends a smaller cone of light than a near object independent of their sizes. But the, the visual field, a term I use from time to time too, is actually tends to get reified, just like sensations do. You really have to try and put yourself back to the two-year-old's level. You don't know anything about perspective. You don't know anything about sizes kind of in the visual field. All you know is that you see people walking to you and they don't seem to get bigger, they seem to get nearer. And things, take your hand, this is how the infant begins at three months. Move your hand to, the hand does, quote, occupy a bigger part of the perceptual field. But what you see is your hand is getting closer and you see more detail, your hand's getting farther away, you see less. You don't have this, God, my hand just grew. What happened here? So may I ask no, for No, but I have to correct for that by a theory of vision. No, this is what it looks like for something the same size to be close. This is what it looks like for something of the same size to be farther. That's what it looks like. Yeah. So, so for clarification, you were talking about you know how uh, individual sensations are uh, abstractions upon the direct perception that we get as the given. So you would say that uh, the experience, the like depth cues are uh, there are no another depth aspect. Cues. Well, uh, that's a mistake. That's the kind of thing that gives some blasts. There's no such thing as depth perception. There is only the seeing in the spatial layout that we perceive things where some things occlude others. Some things don't. Some things show more parallax than others. And this is all part of how we perceive. I'm jumping on you not to think, say that's such a horrible thing, but you have to reconceptualize. They're not cues for depth because depth is not something that's seen. What you see is entities. Go ahead, see if you can make the point anyway. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, so... Um, the, the distance of an entity from your location is one of the things that the brain is automatically integrating for you into the perception level? It affects, level? yeah, it, I, I, something like that. It affects the distance from you is picked up, Gibson would say, in many ways. For instance, ground is very important for Gibson, rightly so. As I look out, on the people there, I am aware of the ground that they're on and I'm aware of the way the texture in the carpet compresses and I can see much more detail of things that are close than things that are far. If you remove detail, you remove depth perception. Now, I've experienced this myself in looking out at 
uh, from an airplane window at the ocean, if you ever have the opportunity, a completely clear day, and you look out your air, uh, your window on the plane, you can see little waves down below you, and you follow out. At a certain point, the waves are too small to see, and you just see blue. What happens there, and it's shocking, what happens there is it's no longer in space. It's like the sky. Having lost the progression of detail and it's now just blue, you can't tell if you're looking at the sky or the ocean. It's not, and it's doesn't, it isn't experienced as, oh, well, that's way out there. You don't know where it is. It's, it's just a blue experience, so to speak. It's not, it, it, you do not perceive entities arrayed in space without the detail and without the progression of the detail getting more compressed and losing the fine points as it recedes from you. So that's one of the, quote, cues for depth. There are many others, and there's many that Gibson goes into in the Ecological Foundation. Terrific book. I didn't know any of this stuff before I read this book. So now let me take out. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Harry, my question has to do with the statement that uh, entities are given in perception. And I'd like to use the example of uh, me looking at you when you're speaking. Uh, I'm looking at you. I'm an adult. So I realize that your eyeglasses are not part of you. Uh, the black band on your wrist doesn't mean that your wrist is black. That's se a separate entity. Right. Would a six-month-old realize that they're no. separate? No. And when we say entities... We're not distinguish. Uh, when I say entities here, I'm not distinguishing uh, de detachable versus non-detachable. <coughs> Just that there's either a part of me or a thing on me, as opposed to here, where you don't see any sub-entity, right? Or this is motion, it's not an entity, and you don't see it distinct as something like, oh, I see motion, I wonder if there's anything that's moving. You see my hand moving. So it doesn't, it's not given in perception what, whether you can take it off or not, just that it is a, um, a place where there's a different kind of something, okay? Maybe it'll come off, maybe it won't. That's a good question. Yes? Aren't dreams derivative, given that the content of dreams relies on what the subconscious has retained from previous experiences? Aren't and dreams what? From, retained from previous experiences. They're based upon uh, past perceptual material, yes. Oh, and I should have said, well, I guess i say in the next lecture, if you're born blind, you never have visual dreams. Now, I concluded this from philosophic principles, but got a little nervous when I was, began to teach it to actual people. And I had a student at Hunter College who was born blind, and he confirmed, yes, he never had a visual dream, which, of course, would be impossible because there's nothing to make the dream out of. But uh, does that mean it's derivative? Or? Yes. Okay. It's both derivative and non-cognitive, just like emotions. Emotions okay. are derivative and non-cognitive. Uh, imagination is derivative and non-cognitive. Everything is derivative from perception. Everything. That's going to be covered next time, too. Yes? In yesterday's lecture, you said that knowledge is persistent. Well... Perception is transitory, I think, yet it provides knowledge. Only if it's retained. That's a good question. That's precisely the distinction I make between looking out the window in the car, humming to yourself, watching the scene go by, and saying, oh, look, there's a farmhouse. I, I remember that farmhouse. We've passed that farmhouse before. That's on this road. That's an interesting farmhouse. You don't have to use the words, but even if you're one, you notice it. It gets your attention. 
you remember it, and the next day when you drive by, ah, you recognize it. That's knowledge. That's perceptual knowledge. But just, you know, what's not retained, that's perception. You're aware of it while you're aware of it, but you don't remember it. It seems like there's sort of a middle ground if I'm, Problem. say, driving along and there's a, a big rig in front of me. You know, I, it seems like it's reasonable to say I know that there is a big rig in front of me. I can see it right there, but I may not remember specifically oh. that because, you know, the next day it's not in front of me. So you want to say I know it now. I know mm -hmm. there's... I know it's there now, but it's still transitory. It wouldn't come up. You would say, I see it, but why would you say, I know it, if it were transitory? You would, well, knowledge I, as opposed to what, well, I only believe it, or? Well, but, I mean, at the time, I clearly have a grasp of the fact that it is there. If you have it five minutes later, then you have knowledge. I don't think this discussion goes anywhere because it's, yes, there can be borderline cases. I don't think that throws anything into doubt or question. Yeah. So consciousness depends on life, as you said. Last question. Go ahead. Consciousness depends on life, requires a living entity, and as you said, a machine cannot be conscious. But a what machine is, can what? Cannot be conscious. Right. Uh, as you've explained in your, in your book. But yeah. what is metaphysically special about life? Is it because life is self-organizing? It forms sort of an integrated whole? I don't think there's anything so special about life. He's asking about, I, I make the statement that before a uh, computer could be built to be conscious, it would have to be alive. And I, I don't know that, I'm, my position is not that there's something kind of metaphysically strange about life that it affords consciousness. I just think that consciousness, it, it, it's just like this almost just like this. <laughs> Can we build a machine that's healthy? No, you, health is, is dependent upon life. You would have to build a machine that's a living organism, then it could be healthy or unhealthy. And when you talk about the machine's healthy, meaning all the parts are working well together, that's not really health. That's an analogy to health. To really build a machine that's healthy, you'd have to have a machine that's alive. So then one could say, well, what's so special about life? I mean, why is life metaphysically supportive of health so you can have health with life, but you can't have it with, without life? No, it's just that health is a condition of life and consciousness is a condition of life. Consciousness is what life uses to sustain itself when it has to deal with changing circumstances, quick, did I say has to use, something that life has evolved to use, I wouldn't say it has to be conscious to be alive, of course, to help it adapt to its environment more quickly and bridge time and space so that it can react here and now to something that's way out there and not going to be here for 30 seconds. So. It's more that consciousness comes up in the context of a living organism, and it is, it is a inherently value-infused. It's not consciousness to just spectate. To be conscious is, there's this <clears throat> existentialist term being in itself and being for itself. <clears throat> Typical mystification, but there's a point to it. Matter just is. Living things are trying. They're striving. They're goal-directedly getting the materials to keep them going, and a conscious being, its consciousness is part of that striving. Consciousness is infused with values, emotions. Without that, take the affective valuing part out and have a pure perception. That's not perception. That's, not, that's part of the lesson of the kitten experience. The kitten experiment. Uh, that 
action in the world and having an effect on the world is part of what is perception. Perception is a living function. And if you try and sever it from that context, what you have is not awareness, not perception, not consciousness. You have something simulating it, maybe. I see Anu approaching, and I think that means we are at the end of today's class. Thank you.